one of those mornings, I got my banana, my V8 V Fusion vegetable and fruit juice. Got to think healthy once in a while, you know. My Pepsi's back over by the computer. I got my coffee. <laughs> Some days, it's just good to, you know, sit back and think for a while, to take a moment to reflect, to take the time to consider, to ponder, you know, and talk to God. Sometimes in our relationships, sometimes in relating to God and relating to each other, we take each other for granted. We get carried away sometimes by what we are doing or when we want to be relevant, you know, to get along with someone that we sometimes compromise ourselves or compromise what we know to be true. Often people get caught up into that kind of compromise where they change who they are in order to accommodate someone else for who they are. And one thing that's hard to do is to remain true to yourself and remain true to who you know and who you relate to. Jesus never compromised. He always knew that his mission, his purpose as it were in this life, was to reveal the Father. Everything that he did, everything that he said, all that he accomplished was to reveal his Father. He was constantly in communication with his Father in order to reveal that relationship that we could have with God Almighty. But the interesting thing is that as intimate and as real as Jesus was with his Father, you somehow always sense the respect, the adoration, the love, and the humility of the Son of God in relationship to his Father in heaven. Sometimes I wonder if we haven't at times taken God our Father for granted. You know, we want to bring down the holiness part and churn up, as it were, the familiarity part, but sometimes I think we lose sight of the reality part of the Almighty God who chooses to reveal Himself as our Father so that we could have relationship with Him, but at the same time Little do we realize that even as John, when he appeared in heaven, recognized, oh my God, it's God. And he was very, very much brought in awe of the majesty, the magnificence, and the holiness of who God himself is. We need to be careful. One of the scriptures says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. And we need to be careful about our familiarity with the grace of God to such a degree that we take for granted the fact that God is still almighty, that he's still greater than we are. He's still holy, though he chooses to allow us to relate to him as a father in heaven that cares for us and intimately relates to us in a personal way. You know, I like to say that God is personal and he deals with our personality, but God still deals with sin. So sometimes people fail to recognize that when we look at others, if we judge them without judging ourselves, if we consider others and their sin, we're mistaking what the grace of God is meant to do in us. God's grace was given to us so that we would be merciful as he is merciful. God's forgiveness was given to us so that we could forgive because we've been forgiven. There's a reason why you got saved so that you could give salvation away. It would be something that would be a gift that you would manifest to other people about how if someone like you could get saved, then there's hope for the rest of the world. Because after all, you are that close to sinning again, aren't you? There but for the grace of God go I. So, our attitudes and our actions towards the world should not be one of judging, should not be one of condemnation, but it should be one of comforting and bringing the consolation of God, which is the Holy Spirit, into the life situations that we're going through. 
we should be that person who's the first responder the person who's there to give hope to be the hope to be the answer rather than to be the problem standing in the middle of a situation where we say oh well we want a Christian nation or we want a Christian ethic I don't I want a room full of sinners I want a nation full of sinners so I can share the good news of God Almighty and how he moves in the midst of sinners to touch their lives and to help them and apply mercy to their need to give to them a hope for the realization of the reason why they were created and are existing in this life we call living as it is today. My point is, be careful, Christian, when you choose to go into moral issues as opposed to the morality of salvation. You see, the morality of salvation says that person can't help but do what they know to do. A person who is unsaved has no other realization except for the hope that you're able to give to them. And what hope do you give when you condemn rather than contemn for that salvation of the person? It's not the issue that's at stake. It's the person's soul that is in the balance. It's the person's heart that we want to change, not the social ills that we're dealing with. For principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness are going to go on in this world and increase in wickedness and increase in the way that the world chooses to go today. It's going to get worse, not better. But the reality of what happens when things get worse is that the Christian should shine brighter. He should be obviously happy, obviously rejoicing because of who he knows, not what happens in the world. You see, that's the difference between having relationship and letting religion rule your heart. Yes, we have a personal religion that guides our thoughts and minds and instructs our heart in the way that we should go. It causes us to choose things that are profitable for us, that makes us more comfortable with realizing that we're not a part of this world, but that we're leaving this world behind, and that we can influence a person's life so that they can come to a realization of Jesus himself. But if we're constantly tearing down and tearing apart each other, what kind of salvation are we offering to anyone living in this world today? We're giving them no hope for peace, no hope for comfort, no hope because we are reaping what we have sown in dividing ourselves and being conquered because we allow ourselves to be opened up to the world and its ways. Often I sit down and I think, just what in the world am I telling people when I say, come and follow Jesus? Am I offering to them something that they want? Or am I trying to tell them something they should want? You see, I don't think that you realize in your gospel message sometimes or your salvation message that telling someone that doesn't want what you have doesn't help them at all. As a matter of fact, it's going to cause you harm because what you think of as being persecuted for righteousness sake may be persecuted for being just a pain in the butt because you chose to manifest something God didn't tell you to do in the first place. Jesus said, go and reap, not go and preach. He said, go and teach. He said, make disciples of all nations. You see, people that want to hear what you have to say are going to come to you. You don't have to go beating down their doors in order to share with them the good news. They'll come find you if you've got something they want. And the reality is, are you living out the gospel that would draw men to yourself or are you living out the gospel that Jesus said if I be lifted up I would draw all men unto myself that's the difference you see a person who doesn't have a message has to go beat it into someone's head in order for them to listen but someone who really has the gospel people want to hear what they have to say when you are obviously so different than what you were before. When you're so obviously doing something that's unique and different and distinctive, that it's different from what the world does, then people want to see what it is that you've got. They want to know what it is you are. They want to hear how you got what you've got. They want to see that God is real and alive. Because 
after all, why would they be attracted to all these obscure and strange Christians that do all these supernatural things that sometimes good or bad, for whatever reason, are either purposeful of God or are being abused by the person for the ministry of God. But why are they attracted to those things and notice those? Because they really want to know, is God alive? Is God real? Is this salvation message that we proffer the reality of what Jesus said it should be? Or is it just another one of those religious games, religious gimmicks that you see often when used car salesmen are trying to sell some product that they know the worldly ways? So you see, truth has to be the factual reality of your relationship with God. You have to manifest in your life that which God is doing, not with what you want to do or what you're doing. I see so many times that there's so much gospel program and a programmed response of how we've got to say the gospel message in a certain way. And people don't want that. They, they go, you know, I've seen it. I've done that a hundred times, you know, and it didn't do any good, so I've given up on it. And that's the problem with what sometimes our message is as opposed to what the gospel is. Because we've automatically assumed we know what God wants to say and is going to say it anyways. So we program it into our preaching and teaching so that when we offer salvation, everyone sees what's coming. They know that they have to admit that they're a sinner. They have to confess with their mouth. They have to profess and do all these things. And yet, the question still remains. If salvation is a gift from God, if the grace has been given to us by the accomplished work of Jesus Christ, what kind of message are we really proffering? Are we just making it another program in the responsiveness of just a dead crowd who could say anything they want to in order to get through the message so that they could hear the concert? Or are we actually affecting people's lives in such a dynamic way that they really do want what it is we have to say and they're pursuing what we have to share in a more intimate way than they've ever known before because they really do want to see Jesus face to face. They want to have what you got. If you're not talking to God personally today, if you're not walking with Him in an intimate way, knowing Him and relating to Him as though He are and is speaking to you, you're missing the boat. I am. You see, I talk to God every day. I relate to Him in each and every way that He chooses to relate to me today. Whether it be through sunshine or rain, whether it be through clouds, whether it be through signs and wonders, whether it be through audibly talking to me, or whether He reveals to me His Word through the scriptures that I study every day, or whether I hear Him speak to me and whisper to me on the winds, wings of the wind, or whether he speak to me in the things that he does in my circumstances. In all these things and in every way, the Spirit of God moves in my life in order to reveal to me God today. And that's my relationship with Jesus as I live it every day of my life. I see him move and have his being in me. And so I relate to him personally and intimately and emotionally. And I'm fulfilled in my life completely in all areas of it. For the living God has come to dwell in me. And I have the Son, and the Son is life. And in Him I move and have my being, and I have the fulfillment of all life for eternity. Do you have that? Really? If you don't, may I suggest that you develop a church life so that you can have eternal life begin to discover that there is a personal life you need to have with God Almighty. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. But if we sow to the flesh, we shall reap of the flesh corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. That's why you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And if we're born of the Spirit, then God is in us. And that is our message to the world as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ to every living being that can have personal relationship and know God intimately, personally, and relate to Him today as every single person should.